Um, my name is Josh Coombs, and uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Shruti. Uh, I'm also an assistant professor at Yale. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so let's start with Daniel. So uh, uh, Daniel, of course, has been uh, working in quantum information more or less since the start of the field. and. Um, in the context of this conference, he's uh, famous for being uh, one of the inventors of the GKP proposal. So, uh, Daniel, uh, are you able to uh, hear us and, and uh, talk? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, a lot of the questions we gathered from some of the participants of last year's uh, workshop and, and people were sort of curious about the history of the GKP paper. So, like, what led you to think about uh, encoding a qubit into an oscillator of all things? Right, so um, so since we're delving into the history, I just want to start off by reminding everybody that, that this was a long time ago, 20 years ago, conditions were, were kind of different from today. I mean, for one thing, you could get on an airplane and go visit somebody and talk to them in person. Um, yeah, I'm assuming some people are laughing and hopefully not too many people are sobbing quietly. Mm. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, the, the, basically it started on a, a visit uh, to Caltech. I was, I was at the time a postdoc at Microsoft um, in Seattle because Station Q did not exist back then. Um, and John and I were discussing papers by um, Sam Brownstein and by Lloyd and Slotin which talked about error correcting codes with continuous variables. And mm -hmm. we were dissatisfied with those papers. Those papers were actually, uh, I was a little just surprised to discover when I went back a little bit older. Those were dating back from 1997. But anyway, we were dissatisfied because they used multiple modes and were encoding continuous variables and continuous variables. Um, but they used an error model where, you know, one of the modes could have an arbitrary error something arbitrarily bad could happen to that mode. And the other modes were perfect. And you know, there was some little bit of discussion about finite precision and did that totally mess things up and things like that. But we didn't think this was a very realistic error model. We thought it was much more realistic given that you have this infinite dimensional Hilbert space that each mode would have some sort of small error. And the, 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 you know, the thing we thought of thinking about was small displacements. Um, and so we, we talked about this and um, thinking then by analogy with classical, you know, continuous variables. If you have a classical continuous variable and you have small displacements, what do you do? Well, you discretize it. It's actually known by the somewhat confusing name of quantization in the classical literature. And so you put, you know, here is zero and here is one. And if you're somewhere in between, you kind of kick it back to the closest one. And so we wanted to do that for, for quantum codes. And, and that was, you know, that, that was where the codes came from, GKP codes came from. Now, Alexi was not part of that discussion. Um, so for many years, I was telling people I never actually talked to Kitayev directly about this paper. But it turns out when I was going through my emails to kind of review what we knew when, uh, it turns out that's not true. I actually, once I got back to Microsoft, I presented it to him and Mike Friedman and uh, Peter Shore, who was visiting at that time. And so he did, he did actually hear about it from me directly. Um, but then he later visited Caltech and talked to John and that was the, the time when he was added to the paper because he is the one that contributed the stuff about cubic phase gates and basically completing the universal set of gates. So John and I had figured out you know, the Clifford group gates, but were at least, uh, yeah, the Clifford group gates, but beyond that, um, beyond that we, didn't, we didn't know how to do it. I was kind of wondering about that, uh, and I, I suspected that uh, my suspicion was that he came up with the Hamiltonian at the end of the paper, the cosine. Or I, I don't know if that's true, but that's um, no. That I seemed... think actually, I think that was actually John in, okay. in talking to talking to some other AMO people. Um, okay. uh, my email had some some communication with Hideo Mabuchi, for instance. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah no, Kitaev's, Kitaev's contribution was definitely the cubic phase gate. And another thing I want to point out is that um, if you look at that paper, at the GKP paper, we have magic state distillation in there. 
And that's a right. few years before the magic state distillation paper by Bravi and Kitaev. Right. Um, so this was like a preliminary, and it's a different, it's actually a different protocol that's not in that paper. And as far as I know, it's not anywhere else. Um, so it was, it was, uh, it was Kitaev's original ideas about magic state distillation, and it probably wouldn't have worked without that. I mean, I don't know of another way to do it, honestly. Um, so, so that was, that was his main contribution. Yeah. So, so Victor's pointing out in the chat that you also have uh, mod four parity measurements in there too, which I guess. Yeah, that was, that was a, I believe a way of trying to get the, the cubic phase gate, the cubic phase state that, that, and that's, that part may have also been Kataya's contribution. I don't remember exactly that part, but. So after um, after that this paper came out, like you guys, you know, did some great work in error correction and other things, of course. But it seems like you guys stopped looking at bosonic modes anymore, or didn't didn't go further with this idea. So so what happened? Like was it just too ahead of its time, or? Well, I mean, so first of all, I, we did a bunch of things already in the original paper, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. There's the the codes. There's the finite, you know, squeezed version, there's fault tolerance, there's discussion of how to create the code words. John and I immediately, I mean, at the same time, really wrote another paper about using these codes to prove the security of a, of a QKD protocol based on squeeze states. Mm -hmm. um, that I think was the first proof of a continuous variable QKD protocol. Um, John wrote a paper shortly after with Jim Harrington about multi-mode codes based on the same, same sort of model. Um, and, and he's continued to write, you know, occasional papers over the years, um, some more recently, mostly, mostly more recently. I mean, more like in the last five years, maybe, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I moved on to other things. I mean, the main, the main thing is that we had a, um, I mean, the, to me, anyway, the most pressing question that was left from that paper was how do you make the code words? And we didn't really have a good idea about that. Um, and you know, I'm not from an AMO background. Neither John or Alexi is from an AMO background. And a lot of the tools, you know, that that we would use today just didn't exist back then. I mean, transmons hadn't been invented; they wouldn't be for a number of years after that. Um, so it was a, it was a hard problem, and it did, but it didn't seem the time was right for that. So in that sense, yeah, it was a little bit ahead of its time. But honestly, back then everything was ahead of its time. All right, David, do you I have a question? Well, I was going to throw in some thoughts. Maybe Daniel would come to this also. That um, uh, and maybe this gives the perspective of uh, what people were thinking about it at the time. Uh, I will recall, Daniel, that uh, all of you were together uh, uh, at uh, Aspen that year. That is in the year two thousand. Yeah. And uh, at that, at the sessions at Aspen, uh, uh, you presented this work, but also in the very same session, the KLM results were presented, which had also just been invented. And it was yeah. recognized that these two approaches um, used very similar toolkits or addressed uh, sort of very similar thoughts. How do you use optics, you know, to, uh, uh, to do quantum computation? And that in both, uh, you know, in different senses, uh, solve the problem with linear optics. Um, but I will recall that um, the optics people, you know, the optics was the mature experimental uh, technique of that time that, uh, for example, Gerard Milburn uh, thought that these code words were really like beyond impossible, you know, that they were maybe like Pauli would say, they weren't even impossible. Um, and I think, you know, from the point of view of optics to this day, that's uh, probably true that uh, this you know, new style optics that have come along in the last 20 years is what's uh, really made the difference. I think only very few of us uh, uh, besides you and I, and uh, I believe Barbara Chahal were at that uh, year 2000 meeting, but that definitely gave KLM a big launch um, right. because somehow the practitioners thought that KLM would be uh, feasible and somehow the, you know, the, the number resolving measurements, they thought, well, that will, that will get solved, and uh, well, maybe the, maybe it will. But uh, uh, well, we haven't seen that take us to Nirvana either uh, over these twenty years. Yeah, well, so like, that that's definitely sorry, the case. That, that KLM got a lot more attention at the time um, because it was a lot more immediately achievable. Now, I remember 
telling people, probably including reporters, that we're comparing it to because it was, an, it was as David said, a natural comparison. Um, that you know, for ours, the hardest step was the first step of making the code words, um, and that was something that was clearly far in the future. But that after that, the next few steps would be much easier. Whereas KLM, it's easy to take the first steps, but it looked like every step then would continue to be hard as you have to get these hugely complicated things. Now there have been big improvements over what KLM originally had. I mean, you know, once you once you get the idea of using cluster states with KLM, it's way easier and becomes much more realistic. Um, but but yeah, but and nowadays, I mean, I would say there's not, you know, there may be there may be kind of comparable. It's both. It's not clear which one is better, right? So I think um, basically in this discussion, we sort of answered the last two questions, which were sort of what was the reaction of the community and, and did you expect the proposals to be realized? So I guess the last question um, specifically for you, Daniel, is um, about the, the sort of properties of the quadratic Hamiltonians and the relationship to Clifford operations. And um, this is pretty remarkable. And I think since then, uh, at least the only thing I'm aware of that's similar to that is Jonathan Gross's recent paper on sort of generalizing that notion to other kinds of codes. Um, so was this something that you expected or was this, was this just a... a um, yeah, so I had to refresh my memory from email and I didn't get a definitive answer to this. Um, so it was, it was in the emails that I had, which means that it wasn't part of our original discussions. Okay. I think our original discussions just focused on the codes um, and, and not on the fault tolerance. Um, so it was an observation that, that John made at some unknown period of time afterwards, uh, not too long, I think. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't anticipated. It wasn't something we kind of designed for or planned for. Um, I wouldn't say it was a real surprise. I mean, the, the thing is that, you know, we knew about, you know, qubit error correcting codes. We knew about the seven qubit code where you can also do you know, the whole Clifford group transversally. And that's kind of the analogous statement here. Um, and the thing that, again, because, you know, it was a long time ago, it wasn't, it kind of wasn't widely understood that the natural continuous variable analog of, uh, stable, of Clifford group operations is Gaussian operations. And they're not, you know, exactly the same, but they're, they're pretty similar. And to a certain extent, they are the, the right generalization. Um, but we didn't, you know, we didn't come in knowing that that's something we had to kind of work out and understand. Um, I think if we'd already known that it would have been kind of immediately obvious because the structure, I mean, if you look at the stabilizer, you can immediately see why it's working. Okay. So, Great. Uh, I, oh, sorry, oh, sorry I, I, just, uh, so I, I did want to come back to uh, one of the points that uh, I think we could, we could talk about a little bit more was like, what was your reaction in the last few years that, you know, now this GKP qubits were finally realized in mm -hmm. the trapped ions and in superconducting circuits. Did you go like, oh, it was amazing. Or was it more like, guys, come on, it's high time. You should have done this already. No, I mean, I'm more, more the former than the latter. I mean, I, it's, I, it was clear, because again, it was clear from the start that it was a really hard thing. And and uh, apparently Gerard thought it was um, actually impossible. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I did believe that it would be done eventually because you know, back then we really had to have faith that quantum computation would come along and develop in a way that, that made all sorts of things that were at that time very far future ideas possible. And you know, we're not all the way there yet, but, but we've come a long way. Um, so I, I mean, I thought it was likely that they would be done eventually, but I, yeah, I had very little idea how long it would take. And yeah, so. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I'd like to uh, just briefly introduce the rest of the uh, panelists. So we have Michelle Deveray from Yale and uh, Steve Gervin also from uh, Yale and uh, David DiVincenzo, who is uh, the chair of the session as well. Um, uh, Not, anymore. We're gonna... <laughs> Not anymore, right. Um, we're going to sort of work through these panel questions, but please, again, I'd like to invite the audience to ask questions. These aren't necessarily the best questions, and maybe there's many experts in the audience um, that might also have uh, interesting points of view, so uh, please don't be shy. Um, so um, I might start off again uh, asking the first question, and um, 
Th these questions are really just the start of talking points. So, um, and they're questions that we've again got from um, previous participants and uh, some questions that we've even had personally in conferences. So the first one uh, is maybe a little bit uh, controversial is um, are bosonic codes qubits? Like, will we ever uh, be able to say, compare an encoded bosonic qubit to the kind of qualities that we're seeing in um, the physical qubits of superconducting qubit, uh, like uh, transmons and trapped ions? Um, and, and if so, like what sort of time scale are we looking at? Uh, I don't know who wants to, maybe Michelle, do you want to uh, take the first pass at that question? Uh, yes, um, I would like first to, to mention that the way the question uh, is formulating is not uh, completely correct. I think we have to compare bosonic codes uh, to codes uh, that I would say are register codes uh, that uh, uh, encode uh, uh, logical information in a register of qubits. Um, and uh, uh, bosonic codes uh, are uh, encoding information in a set of cavities. So I think, uh, I don't think we can compare, uh, for instance, as the question is written, bosonic codes with transmons or ions. And, um, so we, in fact, um, in, uh, in uh, this GKP encoding, we use uh, transmons. So, so I think we have to compare uh, Apple and uh, Apple. So if we compare um, codes encoded uh, in cavities with uh, codes encoding um, in uh, registers, well, I would say simply that uh, the only demonstration of uh, full error correction and uh, break-even uh, today has, done on, has been done only in uh, cavities. So <laughs> from an experimentalist point of view, you know, you're interested in what works and uh, I think that um, it's it's uh, the the it's in the I would say uh, uh, the challenge is for register codes to demonstrate uh, these kind of performances. So from a, an empirical and practical point of view, I think uh, bosonic codes are not just uh, are not gimmicks. They are the the codes in which you we've been able to perform a full uh, quantum error correction. Okay, does anyone in the panel have a diverging viewpoint or is there broad agreement with this? Well, um, I mean, I think we're, we're definitely in the, uh, uh, in the temple of the uh, bosonic codes here. So <laughs> it's a little dangerous to come and say, uh, I believe in register codes. I, I do feel, or I've always felt that uh, there's this kind of Occam's razor of, uh, well, of computer uh, engineering that says that you should uh, try to strive for the absolute most simple elementary working part. Uh, you know, that computing machines uh, at some point were made of, you know, 10 level objects. And uh, after, and it was figured out that was not really such a smart thing that you should actually use two level objects and do your arithmetic in binary. It took people a while to realize that in the history of computing machines. And so, uh, that was why it always seemed natural to me to strive for, you know, the, the qubit and to build everything from that. Uh, but if your qubit is a transmon, then you've already got the pretty complicated, uh, then you've got something that's almost a boson uh, itself. So it, I could only really support this point of view if, I, if we really say had, uh, you know, spin qubits, you know, spin one half objects as our elementary objects, that I would really achieve this Occam's razor. Um, so I don't know. I, I think uh, uh, indeed so, for the moment. So the, your point uh, is that the transmon really it's this cosine potential. So you have a ladder of states as well. Yeah, well, we're it's just sort choosing of, to uh, use sort of a ducting potential. So right. it's barely uh, barely uh, not a harmonic oscillator itself. Um, okay, so that that's just a few of my thoughts. What I would like to add uh, is that in the register codes. Uh, uh, you have uh, a problem because um, each uh, qubit has uh, three error channels. And so you, you have to go to a large, large number of qubits um, to make up for this huge overhead. If you encode uh, information in, uh, in a harmonic oscillator, you have much fewer error channels. 
So you, in, in, uh, if you want to have um, uh, the situation, the feedback situation uh, looks uh, much better. You, you have fewer uh, error syndromes to monitor. Mm -hmm. So it, this is why we call this code hardware efficient. Um, so it's not exactly like, I think the comparison is not fair with the classical machines because in classical machines, you can uh, you just use dissipation to do most of the error correction. If you, if you have, for instance, a memory cell in your laptop, it's a dissipative system and the dissipation is used to correct uh, all uh, uh, fluctuations in the, in the individual wells. So you use uh, the uh, classical machines are usually uh, inefficient from an energy point of view because all the dissipation is used to perform this uh, actually uh, primary error correction. In a uh, near Hamiltonian system, we cannot use dissipation in the same way. And so the argument of the minimum number of level, I think doesn't hold. If you have a, a register of qubits, you all these um, uh, two level systems collectively have a, a huge number. It has three error channels per, per qubit. So of course, expon you're going to regain um, uh, the advantage uh, uh, exponentially as you put more and more qubits. But at first it's pretty hard. Uh, in the steam cone, you have to monitor 21 uh, uh, error channels. So that's an enormous uh, uh, wall uh, that you have to face uh, in the beginning, um, and um, you, it's good to be able to walk uh, before you run. Do any of the other panelists wait, want to weigh in on this? Uh, sure. I mean, I you know, I <clears throat> I think that you know, as long as people continue to work on uh, bosonic codes and bosonic systems, the oh fidelity and the error rates will continue to improve, um, and that's also true, of course, of qubit systems. Um, and as to which one wins out, I mean, probably it will just depend on the actual rate at which these things improve. I mean, and it's, I, I think that, I think, I, I, I tend to think that comparing the complexities of individual objects or the number of objects that you have, that's just not a very meaningful thing. I mean, you can compare the amount of money you put in. That's a, that's a, a common uh, way of measuring. Um, but but really what we want to know is what it's going to be like in 20 years and that depends on you know details of the development of both of them and which is hard to predict at this point yeah i mean there's a lot of different figures of merit um you know um there's the ratio of if, if you're just doing quantum memory you know the ratio of uh, memory time to gate operation to load the memory and remove it or to use it as a qubit and do operations on the logically encoded information. But even absolute wall clock time is an interesting figure of merit because the quantum you're running some algorithm and you need to cache some state for a while and that the algorithm is going to run and then it wants to pull that state back. And you may not, you may just be storing it, not doing a lot of operations on it. And just having long wall clock time, uh, even if there's some time overhead in, in storing and retrieving, that, that can be useful. Uh, if you're, yeah, you in, make some complicated logical encoding, whether it's many physical qubits or complicated bosonic states, then you have to ask how much slower does the logical one qubit and two qubit gate times get? Do they, do you make the lifetime longer, but the, but the circuit depth you can achieve shorter? I mean, there's many, many different um, uh, uh, figures of merit. And, um, you know, I think if we don't, uh, you know, if we don't get well past break even uh, with with whatever codes we're using, we, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> um, okay.
Okay, so I think there were some questions in the, uh, the chat. Maybe we can get to those. So uh, Arne had started a discussion about demonstrating fault tolerance with small codes. Um, and is there, uh, and, and do we have any thoughts, do you guys have any thoughts about Bosani codes as a candidate for reaching this goal? And what would be a convincing demonstration? Right, so I, let me uh, repeat the answer that I gave on the chat, which is that um, there's a problem with my, my criterion that I, that I had a paper with uh, the way to do fault tolerance and the way to demonstrate fault tolerance is to compare, you take uh, some family of circuits and you do them on the physical qubits and you do them on the logical qubits and you want the logical qubits to have lower error rates. Um, but the problem is you can't do that with bosonic modes because you know, your physical modes are continuous variable and, and the circuits you run on continuous variables are just not the same as the circuits you run on qubits and there's, you can't really make a comparison. And this is really similar to what Michelle was saying about comparing apples to apples. Uh, it's not comparing the physical modes and the logical qubits, it just, it's hard to make sense of that, right? I mean, you can, you can come up with stuff to do it, but if you did it a different way, you'd get a different answer. And that's, that's not a, a really robust way to, to talk about this. So I can say this is not, you know, a problem of, you know, bosonic modes are not good. It's just like the, the way I would evaluate this, it doesn't work. And so I don't, I don't know if a good way to approach it. Well, let me ask you a question then, Daniel, because the comparison we like to make is uh, if you had a n physical qubits um, making your logical qubit, uh, you, you have to compare the logical performance to the best single one of the physical qubits that you use. Yeah. yeah. The analog that it's not perfect, but I think it's pretty good is if you have a bosonic encoding, you should compare it to the bosonic zero and one Fox state encoding, because that's the smallest, um, that's the thing with the least photons in it. So it has the longest physical lifetime and it's naturally uncorrectable because if you lose a photon, it uh, you, you've lost the state. So it seems like a, at least a fairly good analogy. Yeah, the, the most natural thing I can think of also, but I mean, when you get right down to it, all that's saying is we're comparing one encoding with a different encoding of a qubit into the oscillator, right? And why, I mean, you know, I, the, the Fox state encoding is a kind of natural one and it's a one that, that lots of people have looked at, but um, it's also kind of arbitrary. It's not, it's not really some, something that's fundamental. And so, so I'm a little- Well, I would, argue, I would argue that it's the analog of choosing the best of the uh, seven physical qubits in your Steen code logical qubit, the one that lives the longest. Yeah. It, it, it's, yeah, I mean, in that I, sense, I don't, it's I not don't, arbitrary. Yeah, I, I don't, don't think it's really on the same. I mean, the, you know, the, the division into, into qubits, is generally not arbitrary. Um, and I mean, obviously, you know, if you have, you know, seven ions trap or you have seven, you know, superconducting qubits, um, those are all kind of physically separated and they have, they have other degrees of freedom, but you've decided that you're not using them for your, for your, log for your physical states or your logical states. I mean, um, so there's kind of, you've, you've already made those decisions in the hardware. And in this case, you just had to, you know, choose something in order to make the comparison. And that, that's what seems kind of arbitrary to me. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think there's an experimental, uh, uh way to decide, uh, you, uh, you realize a C naught, uh, between two logical qubits, uh, uh, which will be uh, uh, error corrected, uh, and uh, you have to make, of course, this C not uh, fault tolerantly, and you require, um, let's say, a fidelity of uh, 10 minus 4, or 10 minus 5, and you can compare um, this, uh, the time it takes for an operation uh, with this fidelity uh, done with, um, with bosonic code and uh, one done with the register code. And uh, and see who who wins. I, I would 
put uh, my bet on bosonic codes, but uh, if I think this is the kind of challenge that uh, um, we have to launch. Uh, basically, high fidelity, fault tolerant operations, uh, error corrected operations, and see what uh, what works best. I think it's uh, pretty much a, a very experimental, very <laughs> uh, very practical question. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, if you can get the logical error rates down far enough, then you know everyone will agree. Oh, clearly, you've got fault tolerance working. Um, and but that's that's like a longer term goal, right? The, it's not it's not the first demonstration of fault tolerance. What about another metric which would involve using uh, GKP qubits, but then uh, when in putting them together, taking a NISC mentality, uh, so no no further error correction. And uh, simply now setting up the race that uh, uh, such a device should be able to say outperform an IBM Q or should be able to achieve uh, a, um, a uh, quantum supremacy uh, a la uh, Google. Um, now is that, uh, is that uh, sort of a moving, uh, well, bringing us into uh, an area where GKP isn't really going to be that uh, successful, or, I mean, we say, well, what we ultimately want to do is reliable computation, not these uh, little NISC games. Um, uh, or or should, in, uh, should one indeed strive to do a, you know, 16 uh, mode device and try to uh, go head to head with IBM? I realize I'm a panelist. I'm not supposed to ask questions to other panelists. Right. Is, that, is that you want me to answer that? I mean, I, it's. Uh, it's on. I mean, yeah. So that's that's again a fair a fair comparison, right? How how can you solve this particular task, right? That's something that that you can ask in either case. Um, it's not really particularly if you're thinking about NISC type operations. It's not really a thing about error correction or fault tolerance, right? It, you could also achieve that potentially by but, just- But it is about having good qubits. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and ultimately maybe you don't really care if they're physical qubits or logical qubits, but uh, but ultimately in the long term you do. And there's, I mean, so my paper had some suggestions of, of the value of, of doing these experiments for teaching us about fault tolerance. And um, this type of question doesn't really address that. So. Personally, I find the, the, the proposal of taking imperfect parts, so like the imperfect transmons and imperfect cavities, uh, and uh, making them uh, collectively more perfect by uh, performing this error correction algorithm is, is a, a fundamental physics problem, which is very interesting. Maybe, maybe it will not work. Maybe there's a, a sort of ceiling to the fidelities we would achieve because we don't understand all the forces or all the phenomena in this um, in our hardware. I think um, we we have very little indication right now that uh, this program can really succeed. Uh, that you make a, a really more perfect system by uh, by assembling uh, imperfect parts. It works classically, but quantum mechanically, I think the the question is largely open. So I, I, I think this is a fundamental uh, experimental physics problem to, to check that uh, this uh, error correction algorithm really work. It doesn't work perfectly yeah, classically the either. System, the best system is the one in which you can make the, uh, the, the most precise comparison between theory and experiments. Just before we move on, oh, sorry, go on. Well, I was going to go back to a remark that David made earlier, which I think is important that, um, uh, you know, you should beat your hardware down to the simplest two-level yeah. system and make lots of them. Uh, you know, the, the number of transistor, the rate of production of transistors in the world today is more than 20 trillion per second. So there's something to be said for David's uh, suggestion. Um, and if you want an eight-level system, you should combine three of your two-level systems. Uh, the bosonic modes, um, of course, require something anharmonic, nonlinear, to to 
for you to have universal control over them with classical signals. Uh, so that's one point. And that's where a lot of the faults are in, in the controller. Um, but it also, you know, uh, Ike Chuang and other people have commented to me that if you were thinking about building up an architecture, you would like it to have to be one kind of thing. And um, so we, uh, in my talk and other talks, you heard about uh, controlled operations on the oscillators, but they're controlled by a different object, the, the transmon. And ideally, you'd like to have a cavity controlled cavity operations. You'd like to have one flavor of thing. Maybe there's some other parts hidden in the background that make it happen. And uh, so that's, that's um, uh, and then there's been some, you know, there have been some C naught gates between bosonic encoded and qubits, but still we're, we're kind of far still from having um, one flavor of object that can do all the things that we want, especially at scale. So there's still, still lots of work to be done. But Steve, um, in a oh. digital computer, you have many different types of parts. You have wires, for instance, and transistors. They, they are of completely different uh, constitution and uh, you you uh, it, it's not a, a digital uh, chip is a very heterogeneous system yeah <clears throat> okay so i know daniel's already answered this in the questions but i just thought i'd raise uh jonathan gross's question uh, which was like is the right way to think about comparing bosonic codes to a physical system with respect to the best corrected two-dimensional subspace um daniel do you want to briefly comment on yeah, that. Yeah, so uh, let me, uh, I'll, I'll say, I'll say what I said in the chat, but, but rephrase it a little bit, which is, um, I mean, if you have, so if you have a two-dimensional subspace, well, one of those two-dimensional subspaces is the error correcting code. And okay, you say, well, maybe that's doing some active correction, but um, there'll be other subspaces that are kind of somewhat noise resistant there, you know, the noise is acting in some, some way that kind of gets nulled out partially for them. And so they'll be more noise resistant and it's not this, it's, you know, it, it becomes very arbitrary of what you're saying is, is actually the original thing and what's the, what's the error corrected thing. And that's kind of what I'm worried about with this Fox state comparison that, you know, suppose you have some noise which happens not to hurt the Fox states very much, then it will, it will, it will look like it's not fault tolerance, but if it, happens to hurt the Fox states particularly badly, then it'll look like it's really good. And so it's hard to, you know, to, to really be fair. Okay. So a lot of the discussion we've been having now has been circling, circling around these break-even experiments. And um, I just wondered if there was anything specifically in addition to what we've already discussed that um, any of the panelists wanted to comment about on the break-even experiments. I think, for example, one of the questions was, why is it that we've seen break even in the codes that have a rotation symmetry like binomials and cat, cat codes compared to GKP or, or we're, we're approaching break even? Well, that's partly because uh, we have easy access to a controlled rotation gate, which we can measure parities and super parities, but. Uh, uh, now you see with these controlled displacements, we're getting access to the things that are appropriate for codes with translation symmetry. So um, it's maybe it's partly historical accident that it uh, one went first, but I think they're they're both making progress. Any other thoughts? <clears throat> well, I would say that. Um... I don't think the, I think it's, uh, there's a question of age. So yes, the, the rotational uh, interactions, uh, the chi uh, A dagger A uh, sigma Z is older. It has been practiced for a longer time. So at this point in time, it has an advantage. The control displacement gate is rather new, but I think uh, it has a lot of future. So. There's, uh, there's simply, um, I think, uh, a difference in uh, 
the expertise that we have on these different interactions. But, but I think the, 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 the control gate, uh, the control displacement, as Alec has explained, has a lot of uh, um, good things um, going for it. Yeah. So I think we're oh, go ahead. Uh, running out of time. So I don't know, there's really quite a few questions left. Maybe some of, Shruti, do you want to pick? Yeah, let me just pick my favorite question. So what, what okay. do you think uh, for these bosonic codes, uh, bosonic error correction, what do you think the major challenges remaining are? And what do you think that we should be, theorists and experimentalists should be working on right now? What, what should be our main goals for the next few years? Well, I like uh, what keeps me awake at night is uh, controlling these beautiful high Q resonators with these ugly, uh, noisy controllers. So finding ways to make that control system tolerant of faults in the controller. And, you know, Liang Jiang and others have made progress in that direction, but it's still, uh, it still needs a lot more work. Maybe David or Dan or Michelle, do you want to say something? Well, I think the, the transmon, frankly, uh, is not uh, so bad. It, uh, right now, it is only 10 times uh, worse than the cavity. So I think that uh, as a controller uh, of an object that should be perfect, it's not so bad. I think uh, progress has to be made also on cavities. And, uh, and the way you, you uh, actually uh, engineer the, the two together so that uh, you don't, um, the, the imperfections on, of one doesn't uh, affect the other. I think we need to find uh, something uh, a bit more modular. Uh, well, commenting as someone who definitely won't be doing it himself, I think multi-qubit versions of the uh, of the uh, cavity qubits uh, are, are will be very exciting to see. And do you want to say something for the theorists? Yeah, I mean, nothing fundamentally different. I mean, you want to see the fidelities get better. Um, David's suggestion is, is good. Yeah, multiple, multiple logical qubits is good too. Um, yeah, that's, those, are, those are the main things that, that seem obvious to me that, that we want to try to achieve. Okay, I guess we went through that kind of quickly. Um, then I'll, I'll go back to one of the earlier questions, um, which is, you know, is there going to be anything new uh, in analyses of fault tolerance or any new techniques um, uh, separate to the kind of tools that we've built for uh, uh, thinking about fault tolerance in the context of having uh, qubits or qubits? I mean, so let me, I'll, I'll take this one first. Um, so, uh, so first of all, there's one, one thing that's not really um, fundamentally different, uh, but makes a big practical difference, which is that when you're working with photons at some level, you know, the cost of interfacing with communication systems or sending it from one part of the computer to another part of the computer doing long range gates, that becomes much less and much much more reasonable thing to build in, and that's you know hugely advantageous for fault tolerance. I mean, there's mm. um, there's a bunch of stuff you can do with long range gates that you can't do if with just nearest neighbor gates, or that has a big extra cost with nearest neighbor gates, and that's that's pretty important. And it it uh, that in itself is an advantage of of working with bosonic codes even though you know in principle you can communicate using qubits it's harder in practice um, and the other technique that as far as i know is unique to to bosonic codes is this work by well by by Shruti and and etc the other panelists um, about about uh, using these biased noise gates um, and kind of expanding the, the, the set of available bias noise gates that are fault tolerant by using kind of the extra degrees of freedom of this, this continuous variable mode. And I don't, I don't know of an analogous way to do that with qubits. And that, so that's a, that's a pretty interesting uh, advantage. 
Anyone else? Uh, I do wonder about this. Uh, well, this point about you know that somehow it's going to be more natural to have long distance uh, gates or long distance couplings uh, in these uh, photonic based systems in the sense that I think it could be done today with regular transmon uh, uh, qubits if people care to do it. If we, if by long distance, we mean, you know, from anywhere on the chip to some, to anywhere else on the chip, uh, uh, surely that's, that's doable with the other, other kinds of qubits as well. So maybe, maybe I can uh, further ask a question on that. So do, do, for these long range gates, do you have in mind better error correction codes are possible with long range interactions or it's just that you could you know, have some modular architecture? Um, I, well, I think the big gain comes from the new codes. Um, okay. so, so for instance, I've proposed if you use um, you know, high rate quantum LDPC codes, low density parity check codes, um, that so those you can't you can't embed them you know with nearest neighbor gates in in two dimensions or really any finite number of dimensions, but they offer the the possibility. I mean, it's still kind of under investigation, the, but the possibility of vastly reducing the overheads of fault tolerance. So so if you can get that working, that would be huge. Um, other stuff is kind of nice, but but that's where I see big gains possible. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, uh, I'm sort of hijacking this conversation a little bit, but in terms of LDPC codes, uh, what is the main uh, bottleneck that we have right now? Is it just the decoding or? Um... Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of, so there's a whole bunch of bottlenecks. Um, so uh, it's just much less developed than surface codes. So, so we, need, we need good codes of modest size and we need to understand much better what the actual threshold is for fault tolerance. Um, the gate constructions need to be improved. Um, there's probably other stuff. I mean, there's the there's there's yeah there's there's I could, I could give you a much longer list of problems that need to be solved. Um, but but basically, it's just we need kind of all out development of that to see if it's really going to be competitive, mm -hmm. uh, better than surface codes. Okay. Uh, one thing I could ask, this is pretty much to Daniel, who's, who's right below me on the screen. Um, uh, what about uh, 4D surface code? I've always wondered about that. I mean, if you were, one could do that with long distance connections in our world. Uh, would it be worth yeah. doing? Does it have, uh, have possibilities? Um, it has possibilities. I mean, it has this, this um, self-correction property. Um, which means for those who are not, not totally engaged in this, it means that um, kind of if you couple it to a thermal environment, um, then it kind of naturally remains corrected without you having to do anything else. Um, so that's, that's a potentially very positive thing. And associated with that, it means you have a kind of simpler error correction procedures known as one shot error correction. So that can be, that can be faster. Um, the rate is worse though, because it's four dimensional, you know, instead of an L by L grid for each qubit, so that's L squared, physical qubits for large qubit, you have L to the fourth because it's now four dimensions. Um, and so I think you might probably, probably would want other advantages uh, before you, you try to do that, but, but maybe, I mean, it certainly would be interesting to demonstrate. Okay, I'm mindful of everyone's time, but I might just ask one last question and hopefully the panelists can respond briefly. Um, uh, and then we'll thank the panelists and uh, take a break for a couple hours. Um, so the last question is, there's probably a, a number of attendees that are new to this area. And I wonder if you could uh, give them your thoughts on what is a fruitful area to think about or work on, whether it's experimental or theoretical, or what are the, something that people should be thinking about. Maybe, um, Michelle, could we start with you? Would that be right? Well, yes. So I think that um, an area that uh, needs to be explored uh, in greater depth uh, is the following. So the, uh, the operations that um, we use uh, by uh, mixing uh, transmounts and cavities are essentially parametric oscillations. 
as uh, Alec has shown, they are depend on, on uh, irradiating the system by strong uh, RF fields. And uh, the, the tendency uh, seems to be that uh, to lower the strength of the interaction and um, increase uh, the drive field. And something we uh, don't uh, really uh, completely possess at the moment is uh, the way to go around the instabilities. We know that um, in this uh, driven, in uh, these uh, uh, systems with very low dissipation, uh, small nonlinearity, but large drives, there are special uh, instabilities that take place and controlling uh, these instabilities and turning them into gates and operation. There's a whole strategy, if you want, of uh, out of equilibrium uh, uh, quantum statistical physics here that needs to be explored and uh, understood uh, better at the fundamental level. So I think this is uh, at least, uh, this is what I view as the, the uh, really an, a challenge in the next few years, how to master um, the, uh, the precision of these, um, uh, of these operations, both uh, theoretically, uh, it's both a theoretical question and a practical question with the electronics, the control, uh, the control electronics. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel, you're next on my screen. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I, I just, uh, for 10 seconds, I want to just mention that uh, a driven system has the advantage that you shake up of all the two level systems and you're less, you're going to be less sensitive to uh, this kind of noise. So that's, that's also an advantage of uh, going in, in the direction I, I was uh, proposing. Okay, thank you. Um, Daniel, could you go next, please? Sure. So, I mean, I guess from a pure theorist perspective, I would say there's probably a lot more to be done in terms of finding new codes and new protocols. Um, the, you know, Victor Albert is, is in the audience. He, he's had some interesting papers recently about kind of GKP analogs with different symmetry groups. Um, I think there's probably a lot more to be done with multi-mode codes. I mean, it's sort of the dominant paradigm, which we already mentioned in the original GKP paper is concatenating GKP codes with some, some qubit code, but you don't have to do that. And, and by doing cover, maybe you can come up with something that's, that's much better. Yeah. That's, I also agree with that. Uh, David, how about you? Yeah, I'll make a much more general and small and uh, simple-minded comment that uh, uh, to the audience, you know, get ready for the era of big quantum computing. Uh, how it will actually happen, uh, you guys are smarter than I am. You certainly have a lot longer to work on than I do. Uh, so you decide for yourself, you know, you. Uh, uh, write a great paper, you uh, write a great uh, proposal, you start a company, you join a company, but uh, I think the train is moving. Okay. All right, Steve, you're last, lucky last. Well, I, you know, I live and breathe the problem that Michelle was referring to uh, right. every day, and uh, that's looming uh, pretty large in my life, but l let me just, um, um, so I, I'm not, agree with everything everybody said. So let me just pick a sort of peculiar corner or, or extreme case that I think there's something interesting. And so you can get today microwave resonators that have lifetimes of two seconds. Uh, they do that by making them big. So they're mostly empty space and not much surface uh, and that automatically reduces the coupling of any, spreads the energy out. And if you couple in a transmon or something to that, it's automatically weaker. But, but think about that extreme limit where Michelle was saying before, oh, the transmons are only 10 times uh, worse. Well, now they're a lot worse. And is there some hierarchical way of controlling a, a moderate lifetime cavity, which then controls something that has 10 times longer, which then controls something that's 10 times longer than that. How, how do you control this thing? And I've fantasized about this problem for quite a while and don't have a solution yet and would be happy if someone would tell me a solution. 
Well, that's very interesting. So I guess uh, Shruti and I would like to thank all of the panelists. We really appreciate your time and your thoughts and, and all the speakers from the session. Um, and uh, we'll try and get the videos up shortly. And uh, we, I guess, commence again in about an hour and a half. So uh, thanks everyone. Thank you.